to introduce Sheffield Hale, fellow Rotarian, who is CEO of the Atlanta History Center. Sheffield is a great friend of this club. We know him well, and he's a true thought leader in the community. You may remember we saw Sheffield just recently when Norfolk Southern announced its historic gift of memorabilia to the Atlanta History Center. And we're so excited to welcome Sheffield back to the podium today to share with us his thoughts on this very timely topic. Welcome, Sheffield. You know, Dave, that, would have, that um, exercise would have made the Soviet Parliament proud <laughs> in terms of the way you exercise democracy. So I, that's awesome. All right, and, and how timely today that we're going to talk about democracy. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about democracy. So it might be helpful first to talk about what I'm not going to talk about. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to give you a lecture on the history of democracy in America, or American Democracy 101, or a dissertation between a republic and a pure democracy. You can go read Alexis de Tocqueville and a host of others on that. Let's just stipulate that the United States is a constitutional democracy that has elements of both a republic and democracy. I'm not here to tell you that this is the most fraught time in history for our beloved American experiment. It has always been sketchy, and your relationship to democracy always depended on where you stand. Just pick an era, and we can talk later. I'm not here to preach to you on the necessity of being civically engaged. You're the converted. Finally, I'm not here to tell you to go see our exhibit, American Democracy, Traveling from the Smithsonian, which will, is open until March 23, or to tell you how we've tarted it up with fabulous artifacts from our deep collections and with great nuggets of information, like that Georgia voted for the Know-Nothing Party with 40% of the vote in 1856, or that it ratified the Bill of Rights in 1939, or that Georgia was the first state to reject the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, but did ultimately ratify it in 1970. All right, so now that that's out of the way, let's get to the issue at hand and what I am going to talk about. Folks, we have a problem, and that is that our constitutional democracy is, shall we say, underperforming. Um, I hardly need to tell you that, but today I want to dig into some of the ways that the Atlanta History Center will seek to have influence where we can to make some positive change, and by the end, I hope to persuade you that you and your organizations can do the same. Tomorrow, our Board of Trustees will adopt a new strategic plan created to carry us through the 100th anniversary of the Atlanta History Center and the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, both of which happened to fall in 2026. For five years, we're committed to bringing exhibits, creating programs, engaging with community organizations, sponsoring forums, releasing clever videos, and more that link people and organizations with all sorts and conditions of Atlantans. Our goal is to help rehumanize each other and kindle some faith in democracy and our responsibility to improve it. All of this we offer as best we can in a spirit of humility and openness to new perspectives. So why democracy? Well, let's start at the beginning. I became CEO of the Atlanta History Center in March 2012, which feels almost like a decade ago. Our journey since then has led us first to methodology as to how to discuss and present difficult history and ultimately, how this approach will help us with issues related to democracy. Switching over from the board side to the staff side of the museum meant that I had a steep learning curve in terms of the museum field culture. The large museums, thought leaders, and associations that make a part of this world were more like an offshoot of academia in terms of their left-leaning approach to issues and a desire to right what the field saw as past wrongs. Much of it came from a concern that was much to correct in the museum world in terms of diversity of staff, attendance, artifacts, and the relaying of history as approached in the 19th and 20th centuries. All of that made and makes sense. Many stories have not been told or have been mistold, and we all want and need a more diverse staff. Some parts of this culture, though, particularly the language, can create barriers to doing the very thing our field is charged with, explaining the past. In 2017, I had a I attended a week-long workshop for museum leaders at Yale University. David Blight, a Pulitzer Prize-winning scholar of the highest order and the director of the Gelder Lehman uh, Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition, included me with a small group of 20 people dealing with difficult history across the country. 
I felt like Margaret Mead from Mars the whole week, especially when I saw museum professionals infuriated with workshop leaders for introducing unannounced controversial history for discussion. The entire point of the conference. I got to watch a whole group get triggered, and I didn't do it. It was awesome. <laughs> I, that was worth the whole deal. But all of this caused me to ask the following question to my fellow attendees. Do you want people coming to your museum with whom you disagree? The answer was crickets. That signaled to me that we have a serious problem. How could we as history museums reach people to discuss history that has been unrecognized or misrepresented in the past if we can't talk about difficult topics between people who most likely agree? How can we then expect to reach people with stark differences? I returned to Atlanta with this front of mind. At the time, we were tackling the interpretation of the Battle of Atlanta cyclorama, as well as putting together a temporary exhibition called Barbecue Nation. Both were fraught, but let's focus on barbecue. As I began to read text panel after text panel in Barbecue Nation before it opened, I exclaimed, how in the hell can anybody take the joy out of barbecue? <laughs> I didn't know it was possible, but somehow we were about to do it. Look, I should have been more engaged at all points in the process, and these methods they were following, were, they were just following what was going on in the field, some of which I experienced in, at Yale. And don't get me wrong, food is often a means of talking about lots of other topics because it reflects much about our culture and society. But due to the strident language and extensive repetition of themes in terms like toxic masculinity, you could almost see barbecue as an instrument of oppression itself. Now, don't get me started on the jewel case showcasing barbecue Ken and Barbie dolls from the 1950s, which label carefully explained reflected gender norms that barbecue reinforced. Now, you know what was clever that made the same point on an opposite wall? A joyous photo of a female pitmaster in Harlem with a quote slathered in big letters from the sainted dean of American cookery, James Beard, that said simply, outdoor cooking is men's work. Now that's funny <laughs> and effective, and it says all it needs to say. We don't have to use language. Those are examples are just a few that demonstrate to me the important things that could be obscured by what James Carville calls faculty lounge talk, which to describe such talk in such talk is performative, full of white saviorism and heteronormative language. During this time, we had been addressing the issue of Confederate monuments across the country, and Stone Mountain in particular. For some reason, though this issue was no doubt controversial, it was a controversy that felt right and suited to our expertise. When addressing the Confederate monument issue, we, considered, we consistently came back to using historical context as a means of discussing larger issues. These monuments just don't bring up issues related to the Confederacy. They bring up everything the Confederacy stood for, including slavery, and later Jim Crow segregation, and the fundamental principle laid out by Confederate leaders that all men were not created equal. We dealt with similar issues through the Cyclorama Project, though in this I didn't go unscathed. One commenter on a Facebook thread connected to an Atlanta Magazine article on the Cyclorama restoration railed against Sheffield Hale and his bedwetting leftist friends. <laughs> I'm looking around the audience to see if any of you are here. Okay, I know this is all pretty insider baseball, so let me give you a hot current example in the news, critical race theory. What even is it? We could spend a whole session on it. Critical race theory, to oversimplify it to an extreme, essentially argues that systems such as the legal system are inherently racist and must be completely recreated. Now it is true that little, if any of this, is taught as such to fifth graders, and very few people opposing it have any idea what it is. But it is instructive as how the words, concept, and even history can be weaponized. For some people, they've arrived at the conclusion that history that reflects negatively on the country and that deals with race is, by definition, critical race theory. It seems to me that what folks are really upset about is this. It seems possible that his history is taught in schools, some schools, it points out that many white people in a historical past acted in a way that would be Republican polite society. Okay. Pretty hard to argue with. Five or 10 years ago, the complaint was that school curriculum was attacking heritage when they posted that slavery was the root cause of the Civil War. In case you're confused about the difference between history and heritage, heritage is history with all the bad parts left out. 
We must realize at the same time that the backlash of this concept of a difficult past gets traction partly due to the ineffective and incendiary use of jargon. It was the above examples and others that led to the development of our guiding principles, a commitment and description of the methods that we use as a history center to tackle difficult and controversial history, and now which will guide us in talking about the elements of democracy. In short, they say, words matter and show your work. We commit to staying in a place where we can talk to everyone who's willing to be civil and respectful, regardless of ideology. It's hard to do, and sometimes it doesn't seem possible, but these principles were written and adopted in, 19, in 2019, and they continue to grow in relevance. And if you don't think that words matter, just think what defund the police and even let's go, Brandon, have wrought. We also don't believe that the world is inherently zero sum. Zero sum means that resources are limited and can't be changed, so groups are always competing for them. In other words, if you're not winning, you're losing. Or in the words of the immortal Ricky Bobby, if you're not first, you're last. Instead of a zero-sum approach, we approach history and democracy with a focus on and, not or. Now, how is this related to our constitutional democracy? Our goal and mission are to connect people, culture, and history in a way of trying to strengthen communities by stressing that our history is all of ours. Though it might have been exper experienced differently by our ancestors, we also believe that history informs our common present and future. Reflecting on the Atlanta History Center's role in the Confederate Monument debate, along with the challenges to communication the field faced as a whole, we realized that we were thinking about our strategic focus in the wrong way. The question shouldn't be, what is the next controversial or current issue that we're qualified to weigh in on? Rather, as a history organization, the question should be, how can history identify the cracks in our foundation as a democracy, republic, and society? How can a history museum be a part of the solution in a way that other organizations can't? From our new strategic plan, we will focus on the role that the Atlanta History Center can play in a functional democratic system and hold democracy at the center of our research, scholarship, and storytelling. As people across our city, state, and country consider what it means to create a democracy functioning by and for everyone, Atlanta History Center will use its resources to explore the history of the components that make a healthy democratic system, including methods of civic engagement, widespread and informed voter participation, civil rights, and community heritage. Now, before we go much further, I want to pause for a moment and walk the talk, if you will, and ask you at your tables to take 10 minutes to discuss how these ideas might affect your own company's organization's lives, or you can check your email. I don't care. This result, this work is complex, and obviously one organization or even 100 can't be successful without partners and help. Here are the questions I want your tables to think about and discuss. How is the current condition of democracy impacting your business, organization, or clients, customers? What are the unique core characteristics of you, your organization, that could address these matters? What can you do to create a better environment for democracy? Okay, you've got 10 minutes to fix it. Um, and there will be no report out, so no pressure on that. And if you want to talk about it later, come see me, and I'll, I'll wrap up after 10 minutes is up. Thank you very much. I always want to do that. All right, folks, we've got it all figured out. Now I'm going to give you the answer, OK? <laughs> Guess what? Democracy is really complicated. Uh, the issues we see today don't have a one-size-fits-all solution, and they don't have a solution rooted purely in one ideology. As a history organization, we're thinking about the unique qualities that we can bring to this debate. For us, those are a trusted platform, a non-political, non-partisan, non-governmental entity, primary sources and documentation that we're continuously working to expand and that can be analyzed to trace the origins of some of our current issues, especially when it comes to Georgia and Atlanta, a physical space that has assets and space to host events and exhibits, and a commitment to talk in plain English, particularly avoiding jargon that is more useful for signaling which side you're on than explaining. From our guiding principles, Atlanta History Center believes in clear, thoughtful communication that will stimulate curiosity while being straightforward on the facts. We will not be neutral regarding well-documented historical conclusions that might be considered controversial in the public sphere. Th through our presentation of difficult history, we do not seek to shame, label, or discourage visitors. Rather, we seek to engage them through exhibitions, programming, and outreach that encourage discussions that are empathetic, historically informed, inclusive, and inclusive of all members of the community. Our goal is not to flip audiences, but to try to bring as many people along as possible, while at the same time reaching out to new audiences. 
Importantly, we don't try to change minds. We don't believe that our greatest obligation is to establish that we're right, but to be effective in providing information in a context that can perhaps offer the opportunity to see new perspectives. Using the characteristics I outlined in our platform, we are undertaking several new projects and initiatives guided by our strategic plan. These include ex exhibitions that focus on crucial issues related to democracy, a variety of programming which includes dialogue events, guest speakers, and casual gatherings at cool places around the city, among other events. These are all designed to encourage community and connection focused around our shared and often messy history. Educational programs that bring good history to students in our own creative way free of political influence. A digital presence including short films and documentaries that share history in new and engaging ways. Collaborations with local and national partners, of which there are increasing numbers and many of which are in this room, who have expertise and are already engaged in efforts focused on improving democracy. Look, like a speaker said to this club several months ago about how to engage unvaccinated people, we don't have a vaccine in our back pocket. Our goal isn't to follow our visitors out of the museum and make sure they learn something. But we hope that through these and other projects, we can give the opportunity for surprise, perspective, and dare I say it, joy. In closing, while several of the examples I have given are focused on the illiberal left, examples abound on the radical right, whether it's Charlottesville or January 6. Our constitutional democracy is at times threatened by a far left that wants to take the whole structure they define as racist, classist, or fill in the blank, and replace it with an illiberal one, and a radical right trying to release the animal spirits of nativism and class and racial insecurity. These forces have been around for most of the country's existence in one form or another. What makes it particularly concerning now is that more and more people, whether they realize it or not, are being attracted to anti-democratic authoritarian rhetoric from what used to be the fringe left and the fringe right. Where does this come from? I truly believe we must start tackling some of the causes and not just the symptoms. And if you look at the symptoms, whether it be anti-vaccine campaigns, not turning up at the polls like we didn't do recently, or the Buckhead City movement, one cause is a civic failure to recognize the mutual obligations we owe each other as humans if we are to sustain a durable, self-perpetuating constitutional democracy. What the Atlanta History Center plans to do is to use our guiding principles to tell our history which can explain our system of government, and one is that has proven so far to be the most effective at building a truly multicultural democracy and fostering innovation and freedom, albeit imperfectly. That democracy can only be improved and our union only made more perfect if sufficient numbers of us, of us are engaged and believe it is fair. On the eve of the 250th anniversary of the United States, the longest lived constitutional democracy in the known universe, we can also offer the perspective that it's been worse. Our democracy is resilient if we pay attention. There are, there are alternatives to hand-wringing or retreating into echo chambers and bespoke cities. The folks in this room are already involved in all levels of civic engagement. This project must be more than statements. Instead, it must be about talking to people that have alternative perspectives without the goal of winning. You don't have to win every argument in every setting or conversation. Our view is that it, the other issues in society cannot be resolved unless we have a functioning democracy that has participation, trust, and the belief in the necessity of compromise. Otherwise, solutions will be temporary because they will have, for different reasons, less legitimacy in the eyes of most of the citizens. I don't see, I don't see the need to point at the signs about this all around us. I am optimis optimistic. I'm a big fan of the, empower, of the power of enlightened self-interest in a non-zero-sum future. So let's at least strive toward that. To me, this is pretty close to the aspirations of the Rotary four-way test, the best of the Atlanta way, or even the motto of the state of Georgia, wisdom, justice, moderation. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Anybody I did not offend? <laughs> but one, I'll represent my table, I guess. Um, so John and Chloe uh, came up with uh, a very great idea, or all of us did, for trying to further democracy. Uh, as, 
as a group, um, and they recommended uh, possibly uh, similar events such as Rotary on the Road, but to the uh, to the history centre uh, and allowing people to have a lunch there and, and then get into obviously deeper conversations. So I think that's quite a uh, quite a tangible uh, and useful way to improve those uh, ideas that we talked about. Love that. I'm looking at Billy Levine. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chloe, for being our shill. I appreciate it. Um, she's my trustee, so anything she says is good, is a good idea. Yeah, I saw you there. I was like, who is she? Yeah, if we can get people to come to Atlanta in person, we definitely will do that. And that's, you know, it's hard right now because of the publishers and the, the variant and everything else. But we are going gonna to end up having also our book lectures that we get when people are on book tour. But the, for the first time, we're going to set aside money to be able to pay people to come to talk about what we want to talk about, not what they want to talk about. Um, and, and so that's part of our strategy over five years. We've got, I got a Gantt chart working out. I don't even know what a Gantt chart is, but they tell me about it. All right, who else? Uh, Peter. I think fundamental to this problem is the fact that for two generations, we have neglected the study of social studies in this country. Uh, for a number of reasons, it's been declining uh, in terms of funding available to it has been declining dramatically. So the average American today lacks a basic knowledge and understanding of the world and the people in it as a result of this. And as a secondary thing, which is even more important, and acting on what you're discussing, is the fact that they don't know anything about their own history. Too many, too many Americans today couldn't tell you who George Washington was. So until we looked at the fundamental changes there in the basics as far as social studies is concerned, I think we've, we've got an ongoing problem. Uh, in terms of um, the studies that have been done for the, in the national area for National Geographic, national, uh, uh, geopolitics, that sort of thing over the last several years, They've indicated that the average high school and college a graduate in this country doesn't have this knowledge and understanding. But what the studies also reveal that it's not because they're disinterested. They are interested, they realize that there's a deficiency here, but they've just, been, they've just never been given an opportunity to learn about these things. Well, there, there are a lot of people working on that nationally. There's some great national organizations that are working on it. We're part of one called Made by Us that is going after the 15 to 30 year olds. Um, but, and we've created something called Civic Season for them, which is between four, Juneteenth and the 4th of July. How do you connect those two holidays? And, and we're working hard to get them engaged in that, in that level. Um, a lot of history museums do it, but you're right. Everything's been focused on, on uh, you know, the things that John Yates cares about. Um, but we need to um, focus on history. So Sheffield, you're a uh, student, maybe a professor of history, certainly most knowledgeable about what's happening the history of Atlanta. Um, during the civil rights movement and uh, the racial issues of the 60s, Atlanta leaders certainly took a, an interesting position and worked their way through those. I'm wondering, can you give us some thoughts about lessons that you're aware of during that period of time that we might be able to consider today as we're dealing with <coughs> different set of issues relating to democracy and equality, but still some very important issues? Well, I think enlightened self-interest I talked about was part of that. And being lucky is really important. You'd have Birmingham next door. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> makes everybody look good. Um, you know, that whole, that whole era was not perfect. But people, you know, within the context of that time tried their best. And they were trying the best for the city. And I think that's what we need now. Um, what we want people to do is to get connected locally and give a damn about their community. And if they care about themselves, the, their community and their neighbors, they'll get engaged and then they'll care about democracy. So uh, for us, it, it's a lot of that. But, um, but you're right. Um, that, that, was a great, that was an interesting period. It's fraught in many ways. But we can learn a lot about it. But it helps to be lucky. Um, and it also helps to have people who are looking 
to do the right thing um, because it makes sense for them. Um, and, it, and it just helps. And, uh, and right now, if you look around us, there are a lot of opportunities for that. Um, and I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that our, this generation will step up to it. The new mayor and city council will, will pay attention and that we can um, have, a, have, a, have a good, you know, we don't want to turn into Charlotte, okay? That's where money goes to die, by the way. One more question right here. Last, our last question. I already know what to say, Chef Bell, without making a joke. So um, you and I have had several conversations on this. I guess the point I take from this uh, is that this cannot be just a history center project. Peter's point, if we haven't taught, taught this in two decades, we're going to have to work on it for two decades, to, two generations. We're going to have to work on it that long to get it back. So I think the, the key to what you're presenting, because you've got a five-year commitment to it, is that uh, our media companies, our rotary clubs, our social services, our congregations, all need to be a part of this, of creating safe places to talk with people that don't agree with each other, of really looking at the mechanisms of how democracy works, because it's under attack. I mean, two years later when you say, you know, that election doesn't count, but we've done that, that's a, that's a path down as far as our democracy. So I know I'm involved with Atlanta Civic Circle, that's our North Star democracy. That's what we want to work on. And I think there's a lot of institutions in town that could take up this call so that it's a collaborative between us and let the history center be the, you know, the container uh, of both history and uh, processes that we could use to dialogue with each other. So I appreciate the commitment, Chef Bill, of you and the history center. Yeah, we're, we're, we're hoping, hoping to do that, and, and, and again, it's, it's a, it's a, it is a collective effort. It's about getting people at the lower, lowest level in terms of the baseline. Let's go to the causes. The symptoms, I'm not going to touch the symptoms right now. They're toxic, right? We need to focus on the causes, and education is one of them, talking to each other is another, you know, knowing a little bit about civics. All those are causes of our current dysfunction. And how can we get to others that will help us have a better democracy? All right. Thank you, Chef Bill. Congratulations again to all of our officers. And Sheffield, thank you for engaging us in this incredible conversation. It's so timely. Uh, we truly appreciate your thought leadership and especially your wonderful sense of humor. So uh, come back and, and keep us posted again in the future. Um, hope you all have a wonderful week. Please be sure to join us next week for our Rotarian Daughter Holiday Luncheon, and we will see you then. Thank you.